Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Okay, you have to be honest right now. You have to be 100% honest. Now, I know you can't say this in church. I know you can't say this in church. You can't say this in small group. You can't say this in Sunday school because there would probably be people go, and then they would be like, Johnny, come here, come here. They pull little Johnny next to them and say, we've got to get away from that person. That person is bad. That person is evil. But I'm going to ask you, you have to be honest. Is there a section of scripture Is there a particular verse or a particular passage or a chapter or a book that if you're just brutally honest, you would say, I hate that chapter. I hate that verse. I hate that book. Come on. Now, I know you're going to say, it's the word of God and I love all of it. I know that's what you're supposed to say. You've been been a Christian long enough to learn all of the Christian language. You know all the cliches. You know everything you're supposed to say. Now, maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. But I just don't know. If if, For someone who's been reading and studying the Bible, clearly my entire adult life, becoming a Christian as a teenager, I have read the Bible. I don't even know how many times now I've read the Bible all the way through. I mean, who knows? 30, 40, 50. I don't even know. All of the schools I've attended, Bible college, uh, Bible institutes, seminaries, all the schools, all the diplomas and degrees, it, all of my reading and studying the Bible, the one thing I know, the more I read, the more I study, there are just some sections I'm like, oh, I can't stand this section. I hate this section. And it may be because it just, I believe nobody really has any idea and everyone just throws out these crazy ideas that really are contradictory in and of themselves. Maybe they convict me. Maybe they bother me. Maybe they confuse me. But there are just sections like that. Now, as soon as you say that, especially among some Christians. Let's say you say, I hate the book of Revelation, not the book of Revelations, but the book of Revelation. I hate it. I don't, I don't get it. There's been all these crazy ideas and someone always will come across, someone in church will look at you and go, and they'll say it in such a pious way. Well, it's really not that complicated. It's really very simple. If you'll just do this and, and, and they always act like that you shouldn't be confused. You shouldn't be bothered. That it's really simple and they've got it all figured out. But sometimes you want to look at them and go, I don't know, have you ever looked at church history? 2,000 years, nobody has a clue. All right, so maybe it's not as easy as we love to sometimes pretend to be. But do you have a passage that you just, you just hate? Now, I, I would, now, now you can do this. It's top secret, okay? It's top secret. If you have a journal somewhere that you can like hide, that maybe you can put underneath your mattress or you can put up in the in the ceiling that nobody can find, I want you to write, make a list of, now you may not use the word hate. You may not use the word dislike, all right? Because, you know, you may not speak in such hyperbolic language like I do. Maybe you're much more reserved, but I would like you to make a list of five scriptures. It could be a chapter, it could be a book, or it could be a, like, you know, three, four verses, whatever, just, just, Make a list and list five scriptures. And when I say scriptures, again, it could be a chapter, it could be a book, it could be just a few verses that you just absolutely, if you're just being honest, you struggle with, you don't like it, it confuses you, it frustrates you, it bothers you, you find the story to be disturbing, you don't know how to reconcile we maybe what's going on with a, a sovereign God or, or whatever the case may be. Write down the five that just bother you absolutely the most. And I would love for you to email me those five. You can email them to me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. And I have a feeling before 2024 is over, we may take some of those, especially if they're like individual passages or maybe a chapter, and they may show up for our Sermons 2.0 app challenge, right? Where we're telling people to download the Sermons 2.0 app, and then every day choose a random sermon. But I'm giving you sometimes thematic a thematic thing to look for for that particular week, which I'm getting ready to do right now for next week. So, um... Yeah, I I have a feeling we may be able to use that. So please email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and give me your five scriptures that just absolutely bother you. Now, with that said, 
we're going to be talking about a passage that absolutely bothers me. In fact, I will go so far to say I hate it. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode of the Theology Central Podcast for this Friday, April the 26th, 2024 at 9.32 p.m. Central Time. And you know where I'm coming to you live from, from the Theology Central Studio right here in Abilene, Texas. So are you ready? Okay. First, if you've been following along this week... For the Sermons 2.0 App Sermon Challenge, you are supposed to be choosing random sermons on the app, as random as possible, random as far as you're not looking at the name of the church or the name of the pastor or the denomination or anything like that. You're just looking up random sermons on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 through 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. On Sunday at Victory Baptist Church, last Sunday, I preached on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 through 17. I've articulated multiple times this week, even in the sermon that I reviewed, how much this passage just drives me crazy because I believe pastors rip it out of context and make it say things that just reality tells you it's not true. Let me read it to you one more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 through 17. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Beautiful verse, powerful verse. We took it all apart last Sunday. You can listen to that sermon. I think I did a pretty good job. Very good verse. A lot lot we could talk about. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Another powerful verse. And a lot of pastors will preach 14 and 15. Sometimes they ignore what comes before. A lot of times then they they do weird things with the next two verses. Look at verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth. Now, obviously 14 and 15 are critical to 16 because it says, wherefore, because Christ loved us and he died for us. And now we no longer live for us, but we live for him. Wherefore, because of that reality, Christ did die for us. And because he died for us, because he loves us, the thing that con- could, con- that should constrain us, should control us, should compel us, is his love for us. He demonstrated that love by dying for us. Right? So because we're so compelled and controlled by his love for us, then we should no longer, we should strive no longer to live for ourselves. And as a result of that, because we are constrained by God's love and we know he died for us, then guess what else should happen? Not only should we no longer live for ourselves, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Meaning because we believe Christ, because we understand that Christ loves us, he died for us, and we no longer live for ourselves, we should be now trying to seek to live a Christ-centered life, not a self-centered life. And if we are living a Christ-centered life and no longer a self-centered life, then one of the end things that should impact is how we view people. We don't view people from a self-centered perspective, but from a Christ-centered perspective. And we talked about that. That's how we, we, we know no man after the flesh. That is speaking of anyone and everyone. Lost people, everyone. We do not see them after the flesh. We see them from a spiritual perspective. And there's lots of implications that can be taken from that. But then look at verse 7. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... Now, this is speaking of Christians. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if I know someone is in Christ, look look how I should perceive them. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Meaning, if I look at them from a Christ-centered perspective, I see what they are in Christ. That means I understand what they are in their position, in their practice, they're not a new creature. They're not, old things are not passed away and all things are become new. Because in even as a Christian, guess what is still there? Your old nature is still there. You still sin. You still lust. You get bitter. You backbite. You gossip. You're, you struggle with forgiving. You don't love your enemy. You all, all of that is still present. And for any pastor to tell you that's not still present, they're lying unless they, they mean that it's not present anymore in my position. So I perceive believers and I try to see them not from what they are practically, but what they are positionally. But that verse 
2 Corinthians 5, 17, I'm going to be honest with you. I hate that verse. And I hate it because it's just, when you listen to people teach it, it's so contradictory. Hey, you're in Christ. Look, you're a new creature. Old is gone. All things have become new. And they tell you that is true practically. That is the reality. And you're like, but then they'll say, but, 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 but. I mean, you're still going to sin. You're never going to be perfect. You're still, and you, and you got to continue to fight the flesh and you got to struggle and you got to grow. And you're like, wait a minute. No, wait, that makes no sense. You just told me I'm a new creature. The old is gone and everything is new. I shouldn't have to do anything. So am I new or not? Well, I mean, you are new, but you're not new because they don't draw the distinction between my positional reality of what I am in Christ Jesus, because by faith, I believe and his obedience and perfection and righteousness is imputed, not infused, imputed to my account. And, and so it just becomes this convoluted mess and I get frustrated. I get one of the reasons I didn't review more sermons this week on 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17 is because listening to them. It just gets so negative and I get so frustrated. And many of you who've been participating this week in the challenge, you emailed me and you were like, this is crazy. And this is great. Now, some of you found some sermons that you thought were pretty good, but most of you stated like just how (laughs) that you had no idea how to even process what they were claiming or they were claiming one thing and then contradicted themselves. And it was all confusing. And I'm like, man, I don't want to just... I, you know, I was hope. I don't know. I don't know what I was hoping. Well, I, you know, actually what I was hoping is probably for that to occur. I wanted people to see just how poorly this verse is handled. And it makes me, it just drives me crazy. I, I don't like that verse. I love the verse in one sense. If I, I, if everyone would believe that is what, that is speaking about our position, that would be beautiful. So maybe it's not the verse I dislike. Maybe I just dislike the way it's been handled. Maybe that's a better way to say it. So as the week is winding down, my focus starts moving away from this week's Sermons 2.0 app challenge, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17, and I start focusing on Sunday. Now, I know what I'm doing for the Sunday school hour. I'll be continuing our survey and overview of eschatology. All right, we're dealing with the Abrahamic covenant, all the implications. Uh, I've got a, a something we're going to be doing specifically for Sunday school. So that's what I'll be doing for the first hour, ready to go. All right, don't need to do really any more prep. I'm ready to go. But that leaves the second hour. Well, as many of you know, for 2024, we're also following the lectionary, right? The historical church calendar and the historical lectionary. And it's the lectionary that got us to eschatology. And then we've kind of deviated away from the lectionary readings. So I'm like, okay, well, on Sunday, let me, let me look at the lectionary and see what are the passages of scripture. So I looked. The first passage of scripture, the first reading, is a reading from the the book of Acts, chapter 9, 26 to 31. All right, okay. Acts chapter 9, 26 to 31. All right. I could possibly do a little bit there, maybe. All right. Okay, what what do I do? Do I expand it? They give me just a few verses. All right. Okay. The Psalm, which I know is not technically one of the readings, is Psalm 22. All right. I could probably do something with Psalm 22 if I wanted to do some work. Then the next reading is a reading from the first letter of St. John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, 18 to 24. 1 John chapter 3, 18 to 24. And I'm like, oh, there's a lot I could do with that, I think. I think I thought, okay, maybe. So then I kind of sat here and I'm like, okay, 1 John 3... 18 to 24. Okay. I think I, I think there's something I could do with this. I think, and I, I, I got ready to, to maybe try to map it out. I'm like, you know what? First John, of course, is always frustrating because it leads to all the never ending debate about first John and how it should be interpreted. You got all those people saying, this is the book that proves someone's salvation which then you're proving your salvation by what you do versus what Christ did. Okay, and now you're using the law and then it just gets into a mess. I'm like, but I've dealt with 1 John so many times. Do I want to get back into that? I don't know. So I was just kind of like, you know, going back and forth. I'm like, well, let's just go to the gospel reading for this Sunday. So I looked and it took me to the gospel of John. Chapter 15. And as soon as I saw 
It was the Gospel of John, chapter 15. I literally went, you've got to be kidding me. Now, because I've been, you know, because we've kind of moved on and not really been following the lectionary, you know, so closely, and we kind of allowed the lectionary to just take us off on a, on a kind of a, you know, a side trail. I, 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 there was a part of me like, you know, I'm just not going to worry about it. But now I'm like, ah. Oh. I can't stand this passage of scripture. I can't stand it. Let me read it to you. You know the words. John chapter 15, verse one. Jesus speaking, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Now, immediately we know when Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. He's using very, you know, illustrative language. He's using kind of a metaphor, using kind of an allegory, using kind of a parabolic language, right? And so we know immediately this is going to require different hermeneutical skills. We're going to have to really think this through and we have to try to just focus on the main idea because if you start taking this section apart and trying to take every idea all the way to some very definitive, like concrete, conclusion, you're going to have some major, major problems here, at least in my estimation. So, okay, so we know he's not an actual vine. He's he's drawing a correlation. He is the vine and the father is the husbandman. So Jesus is the vine. And then the, and in fact, I'll read it from a different translation. So you'll get kind of an idea. I got another Bible sitting right, just happened to have one right here. I don't have it open to the correct page, but I can get there really quick. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. So Jesus is the vine and God, the father is the one who tends the, tends the vine. He's the gardener. Okay. That's an interesting, there's a lot to unpack there. How far do we take this? Right. All right. Jesus is the vine. The, 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 the God, the father is the gardener, the husbandman. Okay. How, okay. I think there's just like a general idea that's trying to be demonstrated. So what is that general idea? A lot to try to unpack. Let me go to the next verse. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now this right there becomes a verse of great controversy. This one just leads to never ending debate within Christianity. And it has been debated for 2000 years. Now you can say it's not that complicated. It's very simple. Well, of course, everyone thinks it's very simple. The problem is no one agrees on it, right? Because look what happens. Okay. Every branch in me or the branch, who's the branch? The branch obviously represents people. So there's a branch that's in Christ. Okay. Well, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. But this says every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So can I be in Christ, but then bear no fruit? So then boom, it's taken away. Well, why is it not bearing fruit? Why am I not, if I'm in Christ, why am I not bearing fruit? So then people say, well, these are people that are in Christ only by perv- profession, but they're not really in Christ. So even though it says every branch that is in me, people say, well, it doesn't really mean in me. It just means you're attached, but you're not really in the vine. You're just kind of attached to the vine. And so everyone makes all of these things. Now, some people will say, no, you're really in, you don't bear any fruit. Boom. You're thrown out. That means you lose your salvation. Other people, no, you can't lose your salvation. So what some people say is if you bear fruit, you're proving your salvation you can't, but you, but, but if you, if you don't bear fruit, then you prove you're not saved. So then you're removed, but you, you're not being removed if you were never saved. So how do we, under, there's all these different, uh, different interpretations and it can become literally maddening trying to take it apart. Every branch that is in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So then the issue is, well, how do we, how do we bring forth fruit? How do we, if we bring forth fruit, he's going to purge it so it brings forth more. But if we don't, we get thrown out. If we do, we get, we're going to be purged to bring forth more fruit. Well, why do some bring forth fruit and some don't? Now, some people will say, well, we don't produce the fruit. The fruit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So God produces the fruit. So someone can be in in him, but not be saved. Okay, so now you have people who are in him, but that are not saved. Therefore, God doesn't produce fruit in them. And if God is the one producing the fruit, 
Why wouldn't God just produce fruit the same in everyone? And so is God, is, is it God producing the fruit, but is it a synergistic thing where both parties are working so I can stop God from producing fruit or is God the one actually doing it? And if I'm doing part of it, can I take credit for part? Well, then it be, again, all these questions, I could, I could make a list of probably a hundred questions and we could probably get about 200 different answers. Verse three, now ye are clean through the word, which I've spoken unto you. Okay. So we got the fruit back and forth, no fruit, some fruit, more fruit. All right. So no fruit, some fruit, more fruit. But you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. All right. Now, now we have fruit to the idea of being clean. What is the correlation between fruit and being clean? And, and I'm cleaned through the word that he spoke to me. Does that mean it's a one-time deal? That's a done deal? So is this, is this re- referencing a positional cleaning or like, how do I understand this being clean? So far, so good. Verse four. Now here comes the phrase, abide in me. Three words, abide in me. Abide in me. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate that concept. I hate that verse. What does that mean? Now, I've heard a million sermons. Look, we have the famous, famous book by Andrew Murray, Abide in Christ. I mean, that book is a considered a Christian classic. You read that thing. I don't know. In fact, I'm going to be utilizing a chapter from that book on Sunday when I, when I deal with this, because I, I don't know. Everyone's got like some, some people like, well, abide. What does it mean to abide? Well, it means you go to church, you pray, you read your Bible. Well, that, that's kind of, that kind of what it always comes down to. Go to church, read your Bible and pray. Oh, make sure you go to small group. Oh, make sure you go to the potluck. Make sure you go to the church picnic. Make sure you go to the church hunting trip. Make sure you play on the church softball team. It's always like everything. It, you got to do all these things for church to abide in Christ. Now, some people say you don't have to do anything with church to abide in Christ. It's That's something that's outside of what the church does. But then some people say, no, you need the church in order to abide in Christ. You can get into a big debate about that. But am I abiding in Christ by what I do? Like, here's Christ, he's the vine, but my abiding in him is all based off what I do. But it says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. So now the producing fruit is dependent upon me abiding in him. So is it him is it God doing it or God will God will not produce the fruit unless I abide in him. But I have to do 10 things, 15 things, 20 things, three things to abide in him. What things must I do? And if everyone does these things, are they truly abiding in him? Well, then some say, well, no, you could actually do those things, but not truly be abiding in him. Well, then how do I know if I'm abiding him? Well, you know, if you're abiding in him, if you produce fruit. But how do you know what the fruit is? Well, the fruit is good works. Oh, the fruit is good works because I know in Matthew 7, someone said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and this and this and this? And he said, depart from me for I never knew you. So that means you can have outward works and an outward righteousness and not be abiding in him. So how do I know for sure I'm abiding in him? Is it an inward thing or is it an external thing? Well, it's an inward thing that shows itself in the external, but it could be the external missing the internal. Well, how do I know if I have both? And it already says that you could be in me and you bear no fruit. But is that being in him is not the same thing as abiding in him? Oh, lots of, I know you're like, you're not giving me any answers because I don't know if there's any definitive answers. Look, I've taken classes on this. I've written papers on this. I've heard all the arguments and I, I, I loathe the arrogance and the cockiness of how many preach this like it's just simple and straightforward and they just do it in a dogmatic way and they don't even bother to, to deal with all of these complexities and all these questions. But it says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except you abide in the vine. No man can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I am him, him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So wait a minute. 
It says, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth that it may bring forth more fruit. But in verse five, it seems to be the key. If I'm going to abru- if I'm going to bring forth much fruit, I must abide in him. So does that mean if I'm not abiding in him, I can bring forth fruit? But I will bring forth more fruit if I'm abiding in him. So can I, pred- can spiritual fruit be present if I'm not abiding? Meaning, now listen, this is very important. Is there a distinction between being saved and abiding. Is abiding salvation? Or can you have salvation but not truly be abiding in Christ? Is abiding in Christ something deeper? It's like a deeper spiritual experience, right? Like you become a Christian, right? You're growing, but you haven't got to abiding. And so therefore, you'll be living a Christian life that may be met with some frustration, some disappointment, some struggle, a lack of victory. You're not happy. You're not content. There's just something not right. But if you'll get to the abiding part. Now, many within church history have taught this very concept that you can be saved, but to abide, that's the deeper spiritual life. You've got to get to the abiding Now, does this scripture support that abiding is something different? Now, most people will say abiding is salvation. If you're not saved, you're not abiding. All right, but if I'm abiding, then I will produce much fruit. Now, if abiding is salvation, then the way is not just to say you'll produce some fruit, then it would be, you would be producing much fruit. What do we do with all of this? Now, the lectionary just wants to give us John the Gospel of John, if, I don't think I said uh, First John. First John is the, was the other reading. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. That is the lectionary reading for Sunday. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to do some work on it on Sunday. I don't know what it's going to look like. I'm going to really use Andrew Murray's classic book, right? Because that's the book that has had a profound impact on many in the Christian world. You may have never read the book. You may have never heard of the book but it's probably influenced you in some way, shape, or form, or influenced sermons that you've heard. I completely disagree with the book, but I'm going to utilize the book because I like sometimes giving the people, hey, here's this text. I could give you three points and tell you what it means, but I I don't know if it's going to be of any great assistance. So here's what we're going to do. Some of you are still working on 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. Tomorrow is Saturday. If you want to finish that up, go for it. If you don't, you can go ahead and start turning your attention because all of next week for the Sermons 2.0 app challenge, it's all about John chapter 15 verses 1 through 5 or the concept abiding in Christ. What does it mean to abide in Christ or abiding in Christ? I want you to start finding the random sermons and I want you to start thinking about this concept. That's all you're going to do next week. It's going to be this. It fits with our our series on the lectionary because that is the lectionary reading for Sunday. It fits for the Sermons 2.0 app challenge. Boom. It it probably fit. It's going to fit maybe for our Herman, our series on hermeneutics. It's really going to fit in pretty much multiple series. And I love when all the things that we do kind of come together. Maybe it may turn into a Bible pop quiz. It could turn into really anything this week. I don't, and I don't, have any good answers. I really don't. Now, what I would challenge you to do, so the Sermons 2.0 app challenge, all right, and I'm, I may turn this into, like, there's going to be so many elements to this. And so in some ways, I don't want to give you I don't want to give you definitive assignments, so maybe I will pull back. We've worked on John 15 uh, before, but maybe for the Bible pop quiz, I'll, I'll, I'll make some very, some, some additional assignments. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to start looking up all the random sermons on John 15, 1 through 5, or just on, you can just type in the phrase abide or abiding in Christ. See what you can find, all right? But here's what I want you to do. I want you to just go through the text. How far down do I want you to go? Um, go all the way to, go all the way to verse seven. All right. So, and what I want you to do is just go through seven verses and just observe the text. Don't try to interpret it. 
Just observe the text and just write down the questions that flow. Like, don't don't try to go with what you've been taught in the past. Don't try to impose anything on the text. Just read it and just write down whatever question or struggle comes to your mind. Just make a list of every question or struggle comes to your mind. All right. I am the true vine. And God, and, and God the Father is the husband, man, or the gardener, all right? So Christ is the vine, the Father is the, the gardener, the husband. Okay, does Christ need a gardener? Like, okay, how do I, for me, how do I quite understand this illustrative language? How do I quite understand it, right? So Christ is the vine, but the Father is the, the gardener. That That's just hard to try to process exactly what that, I mean, it, it's clearly an allegory. So you don't want to take it too far, but okay. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. All right, so then we, we some of the questions about it. What does it mean to be a branch that's in him? Is that salvation? Is that not salvation? What does it mean that, the, that he taketh away? What does it mean that if I bear no fruit, that I'm taken away? The branch that if, if that someone is in him, that's in the vine, the father takes away. What does it mean to take away? And when does he take you away? Does that mean you bear no fruit and then instantaneously you're, you, you are removed from being a professor? What does it mean to be taken away? Does that mean taken away at judgment? When, when, when does the taking away take place? Well, like, what does this actually look like? We have to clearly identify it. And again, how far do we take this? All right. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Okay. So if I bear fruit now, how, how am I bearing fruit? Is it me doing it or is it God doing it? That's, that's the question I have to, because the other one did not bear any fruit. Now, why did he not bear fruit? Is it because of his failure or because God didn't or because he wasn't saved? Like, how do I work that? And if I, if I'm bearing fruit, if, is it because of me or is it because of God? If it's because of God, all right, then, then. All right, then why do we bear different fruit? Why why is it so inconsistent? And if it's God doing it, and if I, for some reason, my fruit is not very much, why then do I, does God get blamed or do I get blamed? Or is it some kind of we work in connection and how does that work then? But then God purges us, so we bring forth more fruit. How does God do the purging? Now, if all God has to do is purge Christians, so we'll bring forth more fruit, well, then why don't he just purge all of us and then everyone will bring forth more fruit? I mean, th- those are questions I have. Now you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. What does he mean that you're clean through the word? Is the clean part, hey, you are clean through the word which I've spoken to you. Is that salvation? Is the cleaning here, is the cleaning p- part, that salvation? Hey, you're like, all these other things, these are addition to salvation. You are clean through the word I spoke unto you. That That is your positional standing. You are clean before God because of what God done. Now the, the being taken away, purging, fruit, no fruit, more fruit, is that all something just separate from salvation? I, I don't know. Because it's just weird that in the middle of this, he's like, hey, you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Almost like a look. Hey, don't get all confused by this illustration about fruit, no fruit, purging, being taken away. No, 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 no. The thing to remember is that you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Exactly what does he mean by that? And then abide in me. Exactly what does that mean to abide in him? Do I abide through my own efforts or do I abide because of what God has done? Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. So then this makes it very clear that my producing fruit is about me abiding in him. Well, if it's me doing the abiding, then I then if I do these things, is that proof that I'm abiding? Now, some will say, well, no, it's not the, the things you do are just your attempt to ab- abide. But the way you're going to really know you're abiding is by the fruit that, that is produced. Okay, so then if there's not fruit or not enough fruit, then I have to do more abiding. Is abiding something that's objectively measured or is it very subjective? Uh, 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Now this seems to imply if I'm abiding in him, I'm going to produce much fruit. So this means you could be, you could, could you be, there could be some fruit and be saved. And then there's much fruit, meaning you're abiding. That would be separating abiding from salvation. So could that mean like, then, then could you have like, you could bear no fruit and be saved, but taken away from a close fellowship. We got, in other words, no fruit means you're not going to be a, you're not going to be abiding in him. In other words, no, you're not going to have any fellowship, any closeness with him. Then if you can be producing fruit, right? Because you are in him, right? You're, 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 you're attached. And so you have some fellowship, but then if you abide now, now you're going to produce much fruit because now you've gone from just being a Christian to a growing connected Christian to now an abiding Christian. Is, is it, is this a different level of experience? For without me, you can do nothing. Now, again, this seems to imply that I need him. Well, if I need him, then I, I, I've got questions. Verse six, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, this seems to make it very clear in verse six that if you don't abide, you're not saved. So this seems to possibly answer that question, right? Abiding is salvation. It is salvation. Now, if it's salvation, are you saying I have to do a bunch of things to abide? You, well, you've got to do this and this and this to abide. Well, then that would mean I have to do this in order to be saved. Now, what some people say, no, 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 no. If you are saved, you will do these things to prove that you're saved. But if I don't do them, I'm not saved. So I have to do them to be saved. And then once again, what are you doing? You're proving salvation by looking to what you do instead of looking at what Christ did. Well, I thought I'm saved by an imputed righteousness, not an infused righteousness. This is going to lead to all kinds of questions. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Well, that raises lots of questions. So I just want you to start finding all the sermons on John 15, say one through seven. You can look up sermons on abide or abiding in Christ. And then I want you to just write down a list of all the questions that, that comes to your mind, all the things that you struggle with in John 15, one through seven. Now, remember the first thing I want you to do is write down five passages of scripture you just have a hard time with, right? That you just can't stand or whatever words you want to use. So start with giving me five passages of scripture. You just struggle, you dislike, you hate, they bother you, whatever. Start working on the Sermons 2.0 app challenge, which is sermons on John 15, 1 through 7, or on the concept abide, abiding in Christ. Then I want you to go through John 15, 1 through 7, and write out whatever questions, just whatever questions come to your mind. It's, this is, there's no right or wrong. Whatever question comes to your mind, whatever thing that confuses you, whatever, like, you're just like, I just don't get this. Now, keep those questions handy because as you're listening to the sermons throughout the week, you can write down all the different answers that you hear to your individual questions and see if there's universal agreement, if you're going to end up by the end of the week with 15 answers to your questions. There you have it. John 15 is where we're going to be this week. I can assure you, when we end this week, we're not going to really have any better answers. I don't think we are. I really don't. Typically, the sermons sound very pious. They sound very spiritual. They sound very godly. They may sound very authoritative. They may even sound so very deep. Usually, when you strip away all the layers, what you get down to is well, if you, if you abide in Christ, then you have to do this, 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 and this. And if you don't do this and this and this, you're never saved. And then others will say, well, you lost your salvation. And you lose your salvation. And if you go with that, the minute someone is not supposedly producing fruit. Now, what people will say, well, it doesn't have to be much fruit. It just has to be a little bit of fruit. Well, no, it says if you abide, you will produce much fruit. And if you don't abide, you're not saved. So then it seems to be saying, no, you would have to produce much fruit. 
And again, how do you know it's actual spiritual fruit? Because there's people who can do lots of external things that the Bible indicate were never saved. Oh, then you're, you're never going to be sure of your salvation and it's going to be a lack of assurance and it's going to be chaos. There's got to be some ways to try to understand this. And we will be working on it throughout this coming week. All right. You can email me. News. If at yahoo.com. That's news. If at yahoo.com. News. If at yahoo.com. News, if at yahoo.com. It's going to be a challenging week. I would say it's going to be fun, (laughs) but I cannot speak for you. I think I'm going to absolutely hate this coming week because I don't know if I have any good answers. Maybe your week will be different than mine. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your Friday night. You've got the weekend in front of you. Hopefully it's great. Hopefully church will be wonderful on Sunday. And if you have time anywhere and all of that, you, know, you can check out what, if you didn't hear my sermon from last Sunday, go listen to that. And uh, well, I'll get the sermons uploaded as soon as I can on Sunday the, uh, so that you can hear what I, had to, what I did with John 15. And uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right. Thanks for listening. God bless.